A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Okay, let's pray. Our Father, we praise you that you have brought us here. We praise you for the redemption that you give to us. We praise you that, Father, you saw our horrible, complete, total needs. And yet you were not stymied, you were not um, discouraged by that at all, but you said, I will save a people for myself. And included in those people are us. And Father, we praise you for that. Send your spirit, we pray, to teach us so that we know your word better, Father, but all the more so that our church here and the church around us and the, and, uh, the denomination, the presbyteries, et cetera, Lord, all of that will be more closely conformed to your word so that you get more glory. Teach us, we pray, send your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are on page seven. Uh, a couple of review things before, uh, before we go. Number one, we were looking at this document that at the top says the Council of Trent. You all have it, right? Anybody not have that? Back here, okay. Can you see if anybody else needs them? There's a bunch. Anybody else? Anybody else? Andrea's got extra. Okay, now, we were looking last week and we looked at um, canon number five here in this section of the Council of Trent. You remember what the Council of Trent's about, right? This is a document from the mid 1500s, about 1560s in that time, which was done by the Roman Catholic Church in a response to the Reformation with Luther and Calvin and, and those uh, men. And um, one of the things that Luther and Calvin uh, developed was thinking about what is the church supposed to be like? And what is the government of the church supposed to be? And during that time, of course, as they tried to develop that from scripture, the, the Roman church then um, responded and came up with this document called the Council of Trent uh, because it took place in Trent. And um, the document is quite large. This is just a piece of it uh, on the sacrament of order. Now, you all know what order means? Uh, it, the word, it's related to the word ordination. Okay, so the offices in the church. So it's related to that concept. And um, we looked at quickly just number five. If anyone says that the sacred unction, uh, no, that's the wrong one, right? Well, the sacred unction has to do with um, pouring oil on people, okay? So, <clears throat> yes, number six, thank you. If anyone says that the Catholic, in the Catholic Church, there is not a hierarchy by divine or, or ordination instituted consisting of bishops, priests, and ministers, let him be anathema. And we saw that the word anathema means let him be cursed by God. In other words, let him go to hell. Pardon my, my strong language, but that is what they are saying. Uh, I want us uh, not only then to go, let's go look at the bottom one, number eight. Okay. If anyone says that the bishops who are, who are assumed by authority of the Roman pontiff, who is the Roman pontiff? The Pope, okay. Do you know where the word Pope comes from? It's related to the word Papa, Father, okay. That's why it's called the Holy Father, things like that, okay. So, uh, again, canon number eight. If anyone says that the bishops who are assumed by authority of the Roman pontiff are not legitimate and true bishops, but are human figment, let him be anathema. Now notice the strong language that they say here. If you do not agree with their form of church government, particularly with the Pope at the top, let him be anathema. Now a couple other interesting things about the Council of Trent. Roman Catholics today may say, well, we don't really teach that. You need to know that the Roman Church has never recanted the Council of Trent. This is still official Roman Church doctrine. Now, we have been trying to develop from Scripture what God wants or what Christ, how Christ wants his church to be run. I want you to notice there are no references to Scripture. Not that they quote it, but they don't even refer to it. Okay in these statements about their form of government. Remember the form of government is called prelacy, also, also called episcopacy. And we're gonna look at some other documents a little bit later, okay? 
but I want you to see that one. That's where we stand. One is what does scripture teach? The second one is um, if you don't agree with us, you're anathema. Yes, Steve. They don't need scripture because they have sacred uh, traditions. Exactly. That's the statement number eight why I wanted you to see that about the Roman pontiff. Why do they not quote scripture? Because they don't need scripture. Now, I submit to you, anytime, where'd my black pen go? Yeah, where'd it go? Over here, thank you. I submit to you that anytime you have the Bible plus X, that ultimately X takes over. That's just been the history of the church for 2,000 years. Anytime you have the Bible plus X. Now, this is not just a, st a statement about the Roman church. This is a statement about the Reformed churches. That means us. Okay? Because sometimes, not all the time, sometimes X takes over. And what is X in our tradition? The Westminster Standards. Okay? May I tell you a bit of my history? You know I grew up in an OPC church. We started attending an OPC when I was about five or six. I'm 75 now, so that means about 70 years of my life. That's almost all of it. I have been involved in the Reformed churches, the OPC. Okay? Except for the last two years we've been here. Now, I remember repeatedly asking things like, what is justification? And nobody would ever open their Bible up to me. They would quote the Shorter Catechism definition. And that's why, that's why when I was in college, I um, flirted, the term used intentionally, with dispensationalism. Because when I was in college, I was around a lot of dispensational teachers, one of whom you've probably heard of by the name of Hal Lindsey. Okay? Okay. I had Hal Lindsey as a teacher at UCLA, not he was on the faculty there, but with a Christian group there at UCLA. And over and over and over, Scripture would come to me from them. Now, since then, through my study of Scripture, I have come to disagree with some of the things they said. But my point is they drove me to Scripture. And that's what I'm trying to do in this class. That's what we're trying to do here at this church, drive you to Scripture. Okay? So, thank you, Steve. Second point of review, um, near the, near, uh, I think near the end of the class last week, Steve, you brought up a question about evangelism and the relationship between between, let, let's call it teaching and evangelism. Okay? Now, and we might want to use the word discipleship. Now, I want to ask you, which one of those is the task of the church? Both are. Which one of those is more important? They're equally important. We get out of balance when we emphasize one over the other. Okay. Somebody want to quote to me the Great Commission? Or shall we just turn to it in Matthew 28? Yeah, let's turn to Matthew 28. That's easier, huh? Okay. Now, Steve, I'm trying to make, address your question, and if I miss your point, please just bring it up again. Maybe, maybe different words would help me. Okay? Okay. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to, in the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, notice this quickly. Jesus makes this command to the church, and he begins the command with a statement that, I have the authority to give this command. All authority has been given to me, right, in heaven and on earth. 
And then, and you've probably heard this many times in sermons, go therefore, in English is an imperative, but in the Greek it is not. It's a participle. It actually says, having gone. Notice it's, it's sort of a presumption. Having gone, do this. And then you have one imperative in here, and that imperative is what? Make disciples. Having gone, so your imperative is make disciples. Okay. We're going to deal with the question, is it this teaching versus evangelism? Okay, so your imperative is make disciples. Okay, by doing two things. What are the two things? You have participles that are called epexegetical. Now what does epexegetical mean? It means they explain. To exegete means to get the meaning out of, okay? Exegesis, get the meaning out of. So these participles explain how you make disciples, what you do, and what are they? Baptizing. Baptizing. Is it a Z? Yes. Or an S? Yes. Baptizing and What's the other participle? Teaching. Teaching. Now, we have two rites or sacraments in the church, one of which is baptism. And baptism is the rite of initiation. Right? When somebody who is unsaved and God saves them and they are initiated into the church, they are baptized. I'm not dealing with the issue of mode or any of those kinds of things or infant baptism. My point is, it's the initiating rite into the church. So here's your evangelism, Steve. Do we, do a, do we teach people or do we evangelize? Here's evangelism, right? And the result of evangelism is baptized, coming into the church, and then you teach the people. And so what I'm trying to say, Steve, is I think your point is good and we need to be reminded. Why? Because let's, let's be honest. We reform people tend to emphasize more teaching than evangelism. It's not good. We're a little bit out of balance sometimes. Okay. If you look at the history of the Reformed Church, that's not always true. Okay. First missionaries were Calvinists. Okay. The big missionary movement in the 1700s, 1800s were Calvinists. Okay. And um, the OPC was started, just for you know, a little history, um, the OPC was started in the 1930s over the issue of do you send missionaries out that believe the Bible or is it okay to send missionaries out who don't believe the Bible? That's, that's what the issue was, right? You know, you know that history, mm -hmm. see? And the OPC was started and they said, no, we cannot support missionaries who don't believe the Bible. Okay, so you see the issue of evangelism, particularly foreign missionaries at that time. And the, the issue was, was how do we do evangelism? Who does evangelism and how do we do evangelism was the, was the genesis of the OPC. Questions? I thought I saw a hand. Yes, yeah, Steve. I think one of my points was that when we were talking in part four, uh, two, two weeks ago, of teaching and how it doesn't, well, teaching doesn't supersede the responsibility of the Great Commission. So if anybody in here doesn't have the quote-unquote titles of training or this, that, and the other, it doesn't mitigate the fact that they have to follow the Great Commission. Exactly. The Great Commission. You're exactly. So this is for... Our responsibility may be, if we're called, to get that training, but it doesn't mitigate it. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question. Thank you. The qu <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just as a side note, okay, I'll get to you in a second, Andrew. In San Diego, we had two mics facing that way. I don't know if we can get that way, Steve, eventually. But we would have a mic over here and a mic over there so we could pick up the questions <laughs> easier. So, okay, Steve's, Steve's point was that, <clears throat> if I can summarize, doing teaching does not abdicate the, the issue of evangelism and all of us are to do teaching and all of us are to do evangelism. Okay, let me, a simple place to begin, this is in the home. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Andrea, you had a question? So it seems to me that it's somewhat sequential in the sense that evangelism starts with witnessing, telling what we know, and since unbelievers cannot understand the truth of God, um, it seems that sharing what we know rather than the teaching part 
Mm-hmm. Yes. So the yeah, Andrew's statement was that there seems to be a sequential order here. Uh, an interesting study to, to sort of um, prove your point, put an exclamation mark behind it. Look at how Paul evangelizes in the book of Acts when he talks to Jews in contrast to when he talks to Gentiles. His evangelistic methodology is different. Okay. So when he talks to Jews, these are people that already knew their Bible, but they weren't believers yet. Right? So he's, he's talking to them, okay? So to, to emphasize, it's a very interesting study what Paul does, okay? Oh, this never got distributed. No, can you pass that around, the, the, the basket? Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> yes, Elder Steve. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I remember a professor in seminary saying and very clearly, when you're a witness, and we, we witness, we use that kind of language, it's biblical language, you're talking about something outside of yourself, right? You, you witness a bank robbery, like Diane witnessed a robbery at a grocery store, an armed robbery at a grocery store. Yeah, it was kind of scary, okay? Uh, okay, she didn't talk about herself, she talked about the guy was there in the line at the grocery store and he had a gun and that's the guy. Okay, so she witnessed out about something outside of herself. Okay, so. okay. other thoughts? We do have coffee back there. And we have some brownies. Somebody made some homemade brownies. Who would that be, Denise? <laughs> <laughs> Denise made the brownies for us. Okay, we are on top of page seven. Asking the question, what is ordination? <clears throat> and we looked at last week, um, what does it mean to lay hands on somebody? And we looked at different references. Sometimes it's used in the term of arresting somebody, like the police would arrest somebody, they lay hands on somebody. Sometimes it's used for ordination. Sometimes it's used in healing, okay, when, when Jesus would touch. Sometimes it's used in blessing. Jesus touched the children. He okay, put them in his lap, etc. And then we go to the look at ordinations and examples in the New Testament. We see that outside of Titus 1.5, which is in a, either an apostle or an apostolic delegation, who ordained. So let's go to Titus 1.5 quickly to just see the reference that we have there. <clears throat> Paul ha has left Titus in Crete it says, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you should sit and order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you, if a man is, and he goes on with the requirements. And the point here is the word appoint. And we look at it in Acts 6, 3, which uh, we're going to get to in a minute in Acts 6. Okay, but but um, Paul left Titus there as the apostolic delegate to set up elders in the church. Now, you remember, we were, got various... Uh, principles of church government and the principle number one is that officers in the church are elected by the people. Okay, we're gonna, we'll do that summary uh, a little later in the course again. Okay, but notice that okay, officers in the church are elected by the people, but here we have the idea of elders being appointed by an apostolic delegate. But if we go look at the other ones, let's go to 1 Timothy 4.14. Okay. Who ordained Timothy? <clears throat> okay, and let's go back to verse 12 to get some context. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. I wish somebody had preached that to me when I was young. Seriously. You know, young, young ministers tend to be full of themselves, and I surely was. Till I come, verse 13, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on of hands of the eldership. You may have a translation there of the presbytery. It means a group of elders ordained Timothy. Now, Paul was involved with Timothy. 
Okay, but the reference here is the eldership, the group of elders. Go back to Acts 13. This is when Paul and Barnabas are sent out. Hmm. Let's go back to the last verse of chapter um, 12, verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, and when they had fulfilled their ministry, they also took with them John, who was surnamed Mark. Now in the church there was at Antioch, now which Antioch is this? This is the Antioch that's in Syria, that's uh, near the, the uh, eastern end there of the Mediterranean, not the one in Pisidia. Okay, when they were at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manson, who was also brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So the point here again is a group of, of the leaders in the church, the rulers in the church, um, lay hands on Barnabas and Saul, or then to be Paul. And finally, if we go back a few more pages to Acts chapter 6, this is the setting up of the diaconate. Okay, and let's begin in verse 1 for our context. Uh, so Acts 6, 1. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. And then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So in other words, the apostles are saying, let's set up these men who are what, apostolic helpers, I guess we can call them that. Now the word deacon is not used in this passage. So call them apostolic helpers so that we can spend our time teaching God's word to God's people and, and praying for God's people. We want to spend our time doing that. And these other people will take care of the issue of uh, taking care of the Hellenistic widows and by implication the other widows in the church. And the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, <coughs> and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they had set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. The point here again is that it's a plurality of the elders that ordained, even ordained Saul, who became Paul. Is that right? No, I'm sorry. That was the previous one. This here is the deacons. So any question on that point? That's principle number four. Ordination is a plurality of the elders. No? Okay, now... Uh, we're going to get controversial now, okay? You got your steel-toed shoes on? Because we're going to start stepping on toes, okay? We're going to deal now, well, the background. We're going to look at 1 Timothy 5.17. 1 Timothy 5.17 is the verse that everybody uses to prove three office view. I once, I, I remember... Uh, one of my favorite um, licensure and ordination questions was, do you hold to a two office or a three office view? And they would say, you know, three office view. Then I would say, please prove it from scripture. And I would get answers like, well, 1 Timothy 5, 17. They'd never open up their Bibles. They wouldn't open it up and talk about the passage. They would simply give the reference. They wouldn't even quote the passage. Okay, this is the verse that everybody uses to prove three office views. So let's summarize the two views again. The, the three office view is that you have ministers, elders, and deacons. Some people, uh, and I think the language is, is, is good, more precise, want to, to call these people teaching elders and these people ruling elders. 
And they want to make the distinction so strong that ruling elders may not preach. When they get up in the pulpit, they don't preach, they exhort. And I have been corrected on the floor of Presbytery with that statement. And, and me, very disrespectfully, I must admit, rolled my eyes and said, whatever. Okay. <laughs> Okay, because I, I think that distinction is false, seriously false, because it leads to a professionalism where I am the minister. Now, fortunately, our pastors here don't have that attitude toward themselves. From my little bit of talking to them, I think they hold to a two-office view. Okay? But it leads to that kind of professionalism. Only ministers may preach. Only ministers may administer the sacraments. Only ministers may pronounce the benediction. And what is the difference? Do you use in the benediction the word you or do you use the word us? That's the distinction. Okay? Because when you raise your hands and you, call, you pronounce a benediction, what are you doing? You're calling down the blessing of God on the people of God. The antonym of that, of a, of a benediction is what? A curse. You're calling down the curse of God on people. Not on the people of God, but on people. Okay? Only ministers, the three office view holds, may pronounce a benediction. Okay. Now, 1 Timothy 5.17 is the passage they use to make this distinction. Let's look at 1 Timothy 5.17 and see. Now, I have advocated the two office view here. You must know that the two office view that I hold to is a minority view among Presbyterians. And you must know that I, when I first met with the elders, I don't know, three years ago, I told them I had a two office view, not a three office view. So I'm not blindsiding anybody. Okay, I don't like getting blindsided and I don't like blindsiding people. I don't think that's an ethical thing to do. Okay? so. When I was examined for licensure and ordination, I told the presbytery I hold to a two office view. Nobody even said one thing about it. Okay. Now, the two office view was gaining acceptance in the reform world, but now is much less accepted. And I attribute that to, um, if I can say this, there's a theologian of 100 years ago who I have really learned to appreciate, named Gerhardus Voss, V-O-S, last name. Wonderful insights. And when you read Voss, you say there's a man who's driving you to the details of scripture. The followers of Voss don't do that. They don't drive you to the details of scripture. And by now we're at the third or fourth generation of these people, okay? okay. <clears throat> okay. But Voss did. Okay. So I'm talking about the followers of Voss. So let's look at 1 Timothy 5.17 and see what it actually says. Hmm. Now who's writing this? Paul. To whom is he writing it? Timothy. Who was Timothy? Timothy was a pastor of the church at Ephesus. It says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads on the out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses, those who are sitting in rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest may also, may also may fear. So you see how people want to say, look, there's elders who rule well, and then there's those who labor in the word. But that's not what it says. Let's look at it again. Okay. Here's the session. Okay. There's the session. Let the elders who rule well, what does that tell you? These are elders who rule well, right? And what are these over here? <laughs> not rule well. Okay. I mean, seriously, isn't that what it's saying? Now, I drew the line down the middle. There's, there's nothing here about percentages. Is the elders that rule well, is that, you know, 30% of the session or is that 100% of the session? That's not Paul's point. Paul's point is there are some elders who rule well and there are some elders who don't rule well. Okay. Now, so let's go on. 
let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. These guys get double honor. These guys get single honor. Now, what is that double honor? I submit to you, at least it's a possibility that it means payment. You ever heard of the word honorarium? See the same root? But notice also, and the reason I read the next verse is, notice what Paul says. For the scripture says, and he quotes something from scripture, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Do you know where else Paul quotes that? You shall not muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain. That's an Old Testament passage. Here you picture you've got a trough, and, the, and in the middle of the trough, you put the grain and you have a big stone and a, and a, a piece of wood that would come out and a yoke on the ox, and the ox would, would go round and round and round, and the stone would grind right, the grain. You don't muzzle him. Why? Because the ox wants to stick his face into the, that big pot in the middle that, where the grain is getting ground and get a bite, get something to eat. Okay? And Paul says, you don't do that. And he uses that, Paul uses that as an argument. Um, I think it's 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, I'm sorry. But he says, that's why you pay the pastor. You don't muzzle the ox while he's, while he's treading the grain. Okay. And the laborer is worthy of his wages. You see how Paul uses two quotes to prove that these guys are over here, the elders that rule well, are worthy of double honor. And he talks about paying them. So is it legitimate to pay your ruling elders? Yes, I know of churches that have done that. Let's go on, we're not done. That the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and, in the word and doctrine. So you have a subsection of the elders that rule well who labor in word and doctrine, right? So these guys over here rule well and labor in word and doctrine. These up here rule well but do not labor in word and doctrine. And these don't rule well, okay? Now, what is this saying? This is saying, as we have said, to Pastor Adams and Pastor Sadorf, we have said to them, officially, we don't want you to have a job. We want you to spend your time that you would spend on a job taking care of us. And we will take care of you and your family if you do that, right? Laboring in word and doctrine. Does that remind you back to Acts 6? Uh, the apostles have said we need to um, devote ourselves to the ministry of word and to prayer. So we have said to Pastor Adams and to Pastor Sadorf, and we could say it to a, what we call a ruling elder, we want you not to have a job. We will take care of you and your family. And what have we said to these here? We have not said that statement to them about that. So these elders over here that rule well have a job. Now, is it permissible for a minister to work in a church, be on the session, and not be paid by the church? I did it for years. Okay? We call them tent makers. Now, I didn't make tents. I'm a software guy. Okay, but I did that, I was on the session, I was the moderator of the session, I was on the Presbytery Credentials Committee, the one that interviews and examines men, I was even the chair of that committee for years, never paid a dime. I don't, I'm not you know, you know, saying, oh, you should have paid me, I'm just saying it is legitimate to be over here, okay? And this can be either what we call a ruling elder or what we call a minister. I want to submit to you that that is the only difference that this passage teaches. Some elders rule well, but we don't pay them. Or we don't, rather to be more precise, we don't say to them, don't have a job, take care of us full time. And some elders rule well, and we say to them, don't have a job, take care of us full time, and we'll support you and your family. That's all this passage teaches. Nothing else. And I submit to you that if you have a three-office view, you have blown what this passage teaches. 
There's nothing here. And again, I'm stepping on toes. I told you, get your steel plated shoes on. Okay, your steel toed shoes. Okay, this does not teach that these men who rule well but don't labor in the word cannot pronounce a benediction, cannot preach, cannot administer the sacraments. Now, one more point. I hold to a two office view, but I live in a three office world. And that's why I would never advocate advocate that the session say to a ruling elder, you go ahead and minister the Lord's Supper for us. You know, be up front. Never. Because we have made statements that we will abide by the three office view. Because the three office view is the ruling view. It's the popular view. <coughs> Questions? Yes, Phil. So my, my question, uh, So is the three office view unbiblical or non-biblical? And, and you're, that's your question. And the distinction you're trying to make is non-biblical is um, a fine point among, among Christians where we will disagree. Unbiblical is a serious point, perhaps heresy. Is, is that your distinction? I would say that the three office view is not heresy. Okay? Yeah, I would say it's wrong. There's the passage they use. We have spent time in the class. Remember, remember when we talked about um, overseers, bishops, equal, equal elders, equal pastors? Okay, how many elders? All elders. Okay. Now, we're going we're gonna to look at uh, one other uh, argument used by three of you, but I want to ask you the question. If the three office view is correct, where in scripture is the requirements for the ruling elder? Your silence is correct because there are none. First Timothy three, they would say is the requirements for the teaching elder because it says there they have to be able to teach, possibly translated teachable, but there they are. Titus chapter one, is the argument used, <clears throat> is also when Paul tells Titus, set up elders in the church, appoint elders, and then he lists the requirements. If you're gonna to hold to a three office view, you have to say, and there are people now that say that, there are no requirements in scripture for ruling elders. I'm gonna, I'll get you in a second. I'm gonna push you to that point. If you hold to a three office view, there are no requirements in scripture for a ruling elder. Yes, Phil. Okay. I'm kind of like Henry Clay on a modern day compromise. <laughs> How about two offices, a ruling elder and a ruling slash teaching elder? Sure, exactly. But the teach and we're saying to these ruling slash teaching elders, that's these guys here. They rule in the church. And they devote themselves, they labor in word and doctrine, right? These people teach and rule, but they don't labor. So that's a more accurate description, perhaps, of what Paul is saying. Yes, L long as we don't imply that ruling elders never teach. <clears throat> okay? I'm, I have, confession is good for the soul. I held this position before I went to seminary. And one of the great advocates of the three office view was one of my professors. And I, I confess to you publicly, backed him into the corner in front of the whole class. Horribly implied on my part. But you know what his ultimate argument was? It's good for ruling elders not to be educated in the theology because they will talk about somebody, and this was his example, accused of being a Gnostic, and if they knew what a Gnostic was, therefore that they would say, oh, that's terrible. And I, and I just shut up. Praise God, I shut up. I did not need to be rebellious and nasty anymore, you know, about that. But that's what the argument devolved, not evolved, devolved into. Okay. Now, any other questions or thoughts? Yes, I'll get to you in a second. Elder Steve. Wouldn't the teaching elders have the gift of the Holy Spirit based on first Corinthians? Sure. That's why. Sure, but, but so do ruling elders do. All elders have, have that gift from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, thank you. 
Oh, my son. <laughs> the question was, wouldn't teaching elders have gifts from the Holy Spirit based upon 1 Corinthians 12 and 14? Yes, and so do ruling elders. Okay, you had a question? Yes, the elders that are not ruling well, who corrects them? Who corrects them? Yes. Ah, very good. Let's go down to the next verses, okay? <laughs> Okay. What, the question is, what about elders who don't rule well, who corrects them? Okay. Verse 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Uh, this is not saying that elders have extra requirements before you can accuse them of things. Because you see, you have to have two or three witnesses for a non-elder too. Right? What this is saying is elders should be a, get the same concern and, and uh, compassion, etc., because they're in their office. And it's really easy to take pot shots at guys in office, whether they be p political office or ecclesiastical office. It's easy to take pot shots against them. No, 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 you can't do that. You've got to have witnesses before. But notice it again in the next verse, okay? Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning do what? Rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may have fear. Now who is the all? The Does the all mean the church or the rest of the session? I tend to think it's the rest of the session. In other words, those kinds of issues you want to keep private. I'm, okay, that, that's what I think the passage is teaching. Those kinds of issues, when you're dealing with situations, you follow the Matthew 18 principle and you go to him privately, et cetera, okay? And you encourage him and things like that, okay? Okay. And if you ultimately have to get to the public, you still retain it within the session, okay? Or a presbytery within the presbytery. Um, it is permissible for presbytery to go into what's called executive session. That means only those who are members of the presbytery may sit in the meeting. Everybody else has to exit, go sit in the car, or go have coffee, okay? Unless you give them special permission. I have been in executive sessions where we had to have people because there was a sin situation. It was an appeal. We're gonna to get to appeals, okay? And so the person that's doing the appealing, the appellant, has the right to be in the executive session, so you give them special permission, okay? And one of the rules of executive session is you may not talk about what went on there except with somebody who was in the meeting. If you had somebody who was eligible to be in the meeting but he just wasn't a presbytery that day, you can't talk to him about that issue, what happened. He was not there in the executive session. And it's an offense that you can be tried for if you break the executive session and talk to people. It's a serious offense, okay? Does that answer your question? Okay, yes, Elder Chris. <laughs> uh, so, so not really a, a discussion of two office versus three office, but related to it, it's the idea of, I mean, I think there's a principle you can get that there are some elders that, um, that have more training, that have a more, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, more reputation, not more, but more, more, uh, more trust. They lean on them more. Mm -hmm. So like, sure. Equal background, gifts, uh, sure. In fact, I'm even in the position that a session may say, you know, we, we need some extra help here. Let's bring in a consultant who's a specialist in this area and come in and help us. The, the issue was, is it possible to repeat the question? <laughs> was, was just because all elders have equal vote doesn't mean they all have equal experience or, or equal knowledge um, or equal wisdom on a particular issue. And yes, very much. In fact, that's one of the reasons why you have a plurality of elders. And Proverbs talks about that. In many people, there is wisdom. Yes, very much. And that's very important. So it's important for people to say, here's a person that knows more about this. I'm going to you know, apply the principle that I have two ears and one mouth and, you know, and listen exactly because of what you're saying. Other questions? Thoughts? I want you to know, yeah, I'll get you said, what I'm trying to do is biblically raise the office of ruling elders. A week or last time, I think, well, if this is true, 
um, shouldn't we have more rigorous educational requirements for our ruling elders? Or the mirror image would be lower the educational requirements for the ministers. And I think the answer is we want to raise the office of ruling elder. And I'm using that ruling elder language just because it's the language we use. <coughs> I don't agree with the concept. Okay, and sure. And we work with them and teach them and train them, et cetera. And we have a lot of tools these days. Yeah, Mary. Oh. The specific meaning difference. Okay. Yeah, Mary's question is, what's the difference between exhorting and preaching? Thank you. I, I didn't address that. The content is identical. So what's the difference? The answer is uh, um, preaching, the, the Greek word is kerux. It's the idea of proclaiming. It's the official proclamation of the word of God. Remember when the guy would get the scroll and go, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye, you know, from watching movies about the, you know, the knights and, this, you know, and all of that. That official proclamation from the king. Preaching, the, the term again, is the, official, is the official proclamation of the word of God. And so they're trying to make that distinction, that the minister can officially proclaim, while the ruling elder may not. I, I reject that, I don't think that's proper, okay. but that's, that's the distinction they're trying to make. I'll give an example why, why I was corrected on the floor presbytery. There was a man who was licensed, uh, remember licensure is one of the steps um, towards uh, um, ordination, and after a few years the church said, we don't think you have the gifts. The purpose of licensure is probation. Do you have the gifts or not? The church said, no, we don't think you have. Uh, Okay, and so his licensure was taken away, but the man was already a ruling elder in the church. And so, you know, I, I had said as the chairman of the committee, okay, because he's a ruling elder, he can still preach in the churches. And somebody stood up and said, he may not preach, he can exhort. And that's when I, you know, rolled my eyes and... Semantics. <laughs> yes, but I, I should not have, I should have been more respectful. Okay. <sighs> Confession is good. I guess. Other questions? I, I want us to look. Yes, Elder Steve. I think some of the attitude toward the reposition left over from Romanism. Yes, I think it's a professionalism of sorts. And it can easily devolve into that. Okay? There is an OPC presbytery that I will simply identify that is east of the Rocky Mountains. There's a lot of geography east of the Rocky Mountains, okay? Where when a minister is ordained, it's the act of presbytery, but they do not allow ruling elders to go up and lay hands on the man. It's horrible. Horrible to do that. Okay? Well, other, typically, all the members of the presbytery that are at the meeting lay hands on the man. That means ruling elders and teaching elders lay hands on the man. They do not allow ruling elders to do so. It, it, it's terrible stuff. Yes, Mary. Isn't that a horrible answer? But it's like, I really don't know. And I have heard excellent preaching, and I've heard excellent teaching, and I've heard excellent preaching. So I do not think that there is a difference. Okay. The question is, what's the difference between teaching and preaching? I asked that question in my first year of seminary. And again, the answer was that preaching is the official proclamation. Um, since we have our Bible open to 1 Timothy, let's go to 2 Timothy, just turn over a page or two, to chapter 4. Uh, this passage is used a lot at ordinations. Typically ordinations have three sermonettes, one's a sermon to the congregation, one is um, a charge, they call it, to the, to the person being ordained, the minister, and another is a charge to the congregation. You don't have to have those, but that's kind of typical, okay? Notice chapter four, verse one. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing or station, preach the word. There's your word, Mary. Proclaim the word. Be the official proclaimer of the word. But notice what that content is. We have our ep exegetical statements again. Okay? Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and 
teaching. So you see that the, the official proclamation of the word, number one, whether it's popular or not, do it, if it's the proclamation of the word. And you convince, rebuke, and exhort, there's your application of the word, okay, with all long suffering and teaching. As somebody once said to me, a sermon is proclamation, explanation, application of the word of God. Proclamation, explanation, application. Teaching would not have that official proclamation activity. What I'm doing right now is teaching. But you know, sometimes when I teach, I preach. <laughs> right? Yeah, and people use this verse for us, maybe not, I mean, not a preacher. Yeah. I think, I think that, that has an indirect application that we should always be ready. Maybe you want to turn to 1 Peter 3.15 instead about being ready to give a reason for the, faith, the hope that is within you. Okay. Okay. But this, you see, the context is a charge that Paul is giving to Timothy, the pastor of the church at Ephesus. This is Paul's last book that he wrote that we have. All right. So these are sort of Paul's closing remarks to Timothy. So, and I think, I think that's the content of what it is. So a sermon has the official proclamation as well as the application, as well as the teaching. Okay. I know a lot of people that say sermons should never have application. <laughs> no, these are ministers, that's a, they're, official, they're their positions. Yeah, we laugh. I know one lady who said, that's like having dinner without the dessert. <laughs> my, my alarm just went off. Okay. Okay. Yes, Phil. Second, Andrew, what do you have when you have a sermon with no application? What you have is an intellectual system that doesn't burn in your hearts and doesn't change your lives, right? That's what you have. You have an academic intellectual system. Now, I like academic systems, but they have to burn in your heart. Yeah, Andrea. Okay. God uses me all the time. Mm -hmm. And I do proclaim the word. I don't consider myself a preacher. Mm -hmm. But some of these elements feel very mixed up. Okay. Okay. Well, there's, there's a couple applications. It's, the, the scriptures teach that women are not to be official teachers of men. Okay. Paul says that they're not to be up here where I, what I'm doing. But that surely does not mean women are not to be teachers in, to, to other women or to their children. And it surely does not mean that the woman cannot exhort her husband <clears throat> over here. <laughs> she has done it more than once all the time to my benefit, okay, where she has put me in my place. Okay. Is that legitimate to do? Yes. Okay. As, as we talk. We open our Bibles, we talk together, we're going down the road talking together. John, you shouldn't have done that. Okay? So there are times to do that. But when, the, when Paul says, I do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over men in 1 Timothy 2, I think that's talking about the office of the elder. Okay? There's the two aspects of the office, teach and have authority. There's the ruling aspect of the elders. Okay? So women are not to be elders in the church, but that surely doesn't mean that. There's a famous story. Uh, do y'all know who Abraham Kuyper was? I'm sure Mary, Mary does. The rest of you know who Abraham Kuyper was? Abraham Kuyper was a Dutch theologian, late 1800s, early 1900s, okay? And he was a liberal. God saved him later on, but he was a liberal and he was very, and he was preaching a sermon and a lady came out to him afterwards and chewed him out. One of the Dutch ladies in the church chewed him out because what he was doing was not proclaiming the word of God. 
Okay? And God used that woman to correct him. There's also a famous story, and I, people know the name of this lady. I don't know her name. She was a milkmaid in the church in Scotland. And the king had proclaimed that the church in Scotland had to have, have uh, all the candles and the vestments and things like that. And because she was a milkmaid, she didn't have much money. So she brought her stool, her milking stool, into church and she sat on it. And the, the minister slash priest was up there and she got up and threw the stool at him and said that not, will not happen in the kirk of God. Because she stood up for the gospel. So there are times when women can help us, right? And there's a place for women to help us. And we, we ought not to shut up women. That's wrong to shut up women, okay? You all remember the distinction I made well, last time in the other course between economics and ontology? No, you can't remember that. We'll do that, we'll, we'll have to come back because of time. We'll talk about that. And, and Andrew, please help me remember next week. We'll go into that, okay? Because it's real easy to mix those up, okay? Okay. Um, we still haven't got down to the issue you see um, when we're dealing with the issue of uh, this excursus we're on, 1 Timothy 5, 17. I want us to look at Acts 18, 8, and 17 about the ruler of the synagogue. Okay, so we'll look at that next week. One of the arguments used against the two office view is the, the synagogues had elders and they were not teachers in the synagogue and et cetera. So we're gonna look at Acts 8 and 17 about the ruler of the synagogue, okay? So that's where we're going. Let's pray. Lord, you have given us elders to take care of us and to look over us and to minister to us. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the women, Lord, who exhort us at times and encourage us. What a gift that is to us. And we pray, Father, we would look at your word and be careful in it. That we would, would glory in the teachings of your word. And we pray, Father, too, that as we go to worship now, you would accept our worship in Christ. We pray that our worship would be a joy to you, an encouragement to us. And we thank you, Father, that you have set up government and the church and for the elders you have given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son.